everyone. I am here with Dr. Pipoli. Uh, this is his second webinar with us. Tonight's focus and topic is on seed bearing plants, Spermatophyta. I have very few brief announcements to go through, and then I'll hand things over to Dr. Pipoli. Doctor, wave to everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Yes, and that's how it's uh, pronounced, Pipoli. That's, that's how right. Pronounced. Holy moly, John Pipoli. That's why I put that up there next to my name. <laughs> <laughs> so so folks, like please relax, enjoy, have a good time. Uh, Dr. Pipoli is here to answer your questions. Uh, feel free to put them into your comments section. We'll be happy to take some of your questions uh, and comments live as well. So uh, let me jump uh, into announcements really briefly, Dr. Pipoli, and then sure. we can get this show on the road. So uh, welcome everyone. I have our beautiful coupleofern.org website here. If you click on a learn more and under the drop down events, this is the page that will show you all the things that we are conducting here on the chapter level. Tonight is, of course, Dr. Pipoli's uh, seed bearing topic uh, live stream. Following this, uh, it'll be on August 15th, which is next month, and that will be on primitive monocots and magnolia relatives. Uh, we have a plant sale coming up in case you guys are interested. The first of uh, several fall plant sales, August 20th, which is a Saturday. And then on Monday, which is uh, typically our in-person meetings when we have them seasonally, uh, it's on August 22nd. We're having a garden party. So members will come up for about 15, 20 minutes present about their personal experiences on growing native plants, share their tips and tricks with you so that you can uh, kind of experiment as well with them. So we'll have a potluck then. Everybody's invited. This is open to the public. More information can be found through coupleoffern.org. And the final portion of Dr. Pipoli's webinar series with us focuses on dicots uh, and has a brief uh, introduction to the amazing world of legumes as well and that will be on august 29th monday same time same place if you're viewing this through our facebook or youtube it will be available there as well and then august 20 uh i'm sorry october 15th uh is our next plant sale the second plant sale of fall it'll be in sanford as well more information on that is available through coupleofern.org and through all our social media channels as usual. Uh, if you are viewing us on YouTube, please hit uh, the subscribe button right here. We have tons of videos now. Uh, this video along with the first webinar that Dr. Pipoli did last Monday is available. It'll be uh, under uh, ferns and spore bearing plants as you can see right here. The subscribe button is in the uh, top right corner. Uh, please subscribe to our channel. This is uh, free, but it shows that you support us, and it means a lot to us if you do subscribe. So we appreciate that in advance. Uh, we are a chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. Couple of Fern is a independent 501c3 as well. Uh, more information about our parent organization is at fnps.org. Beautiful website. Uh, if you'd like to join, even if you happen to be outside the state, you can click on join and just support Florida Native Plant Society through membership. We are a couple of fern, so in case you go and join couple of fern, the chapter that you would select is right here, couple of fern. In case you happen to be in Dr. Pipoli's neck of the woods, it would be Broward County, so you can select Broward. Or if you are in Citrus County, which is supporting this webinar as well, you can click on Citrus Chapter, which is right there. So many different chapters across the state. Select one that is closest to you, support locally, and make a difference locally. I want to also give a big shout out to Dr. Pipoli's Master Naturalist Program. Uh, it is entering its 21st anniversary at this point. Uh, more information can be found on masternaturalist.ifis.ufl.edu or as Dr. Pipoli uh, stated last time, just go to masternaturalist.org and it will directly route you to this uh, webpage. Uh, 
this is a fabulous program uh, conducted by the University of Florida. Dr. Pipe Foley happens to be a lead down in Broward County. Uh, they do the whole suite of courses down there. Um, and Dr. Pipe Foley, would you like to add some information yeah, for yeah. our viewers? Yeah, coming up in July, we're going to do um, conservation science. And ours is different than all the rest of the ones in the state because we meticulously cover the IUCN um, methods for red listing um, species. And in addition for that, the um, IUCN uh, methods for red listing ecosystems, which is a, 49 states and 130 countries follow it. And the only one that does not is Florida, which I've never been able to figure out. Just is really kind of weird. <laughs> but um, but uh, anyway. Um, it's a um, joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a real good, um, in addition to the regular stuff that they cover in, in the other counties, we wanted to make sure that people have a global perspective as well as Florida. Because I think it's really important that when you learn natural history, you understand where you are and the biodiversity around you and how, how you have to maintain it because we've interfered with it. But then when you go other places, you, if you know the theoretical framework of, where, of what you have where you live, you'll better appreciate and go to see the very best part of where you're going. That, that really helps. So a fern is a fern is a fern wherever you go, but there are some really cool ferns in other places. And if you spend nowadays with internet, there's no excuse. Spend a half an hour, read about it. Then when you get there, you can see these gigantic ferns and little teeny ones <laughs> and everything else. And imagine, in addition to all the other cool plants, there was even a plant, if you go to Mexico, on the north side of one particular mountain, and there's a wall. <laughs> right in front of this there's the lacedoniaceae where the center of the flower has the stamens and the ovaries surround the stamens no, no other flowering plant has that lacedoniaceae really cool plant so guys more information can be found through uh master naturalist dr pipoli can talk your ears about uh, some of the cool stories he's a really fun guy i've uh, personally enjoyed my time listening to uh, a very varied and rich life that Dr. Pipoli has had. Uh, but Broward County, it's coming up July 27th through August 2nd. More information can be found. You know, just go to masternaturalist.org. And Dr. Pipoli is an excellent. Yes, Dr. Pipoli. This is 100% virtual, ladies and gentlemen. And yes. we have hands-on activities that you can do virtually. Yes. So you're going to learn how to map out a species and find out whether it should be considered threatened or endangered or what. It's mm -hmm. going to be just cool. Really cool. Really yeah. cool. Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Uh, the last little plug I wanted to give is to Broward.org, uh, Dr. Pipoli's daytime job. So please go to Broward Parks. Uh, this is the parks um, website, parks locations. Um, if you happen to be in the area, it's a magnificent department that Broward County actually has, and uh, I'm quite envious of it myself. So please uh, go ahead and support it, broward.org slash parks. Dr. Pipoli, did you want to Yeah, and you can go to under things to do. You go to mm -hmm. Steam, and there you uh, you can click on our on the Steam web page. And when you get mm -hmm. it's under things to do on the left side, upper left, mm -hmm. things to do, mm -hmm. right there. You click on that, and then it'll go. Uh, there'll be a list of things. You go down to those, and you'll go to mm -hmm. Steam on the right hand Ooh. side. Steam. You yeah. Click on that, and then go down, and you see all the things we do with the kids, K through twelve, and university yeah. as well. And then go down a little farther. Then you will. Oh, okay. This last thing, schools and parks program. Click on that. All the way down here. Whoop, at the bottom. Nope. Yeah. No, no. The, you went to the standards instead of the, the bottom one. The bottom okay. right here. Yeah. The bottom link tails takes you to a page where all of our programs in every park are described in all of the Florida learning standards 
the language that teachers know, like their braille, just takes them through all, everything. So a teacher will know exactly what they're getting when they go there. It's much easier to defend a trip to your principal if you say, we're going to cover these standards. This is the lab that goes with my lecture. This is what our students have trouble with. We want to see it 3D. This is the most important thing for them to see with their own eyes. There are 46 programs. Amazing. So we Amazing. have... We have five nature centers. We have 22 natural areas. We have 17 regional parks and we have eight neighborhood parks. So altogether it's around 6,600 acres that are Amazing. set aside. Yeah, it's, and there's there's all kinds of cool stuff going on. Amazing, amazing. More Excellent. information through Broward.org slash parks. Yep. All right, I will go ahead and close my screen. Put up your wonderful presentation. Okay, and, cool. Uh, uh, I'll uh, leave you to it, doctor. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, it's a real privilege for me to speak to you folks again. Um, the the format doesn't allow for a whole lot of interaction, but if you have something, just put it in the comments, and hopefully, I'll see it and we'll uh, we'll address it. My one of my main missions in this whole series is to have people use the newer concepts for some reason especially in, in the be applied sciences people are still teaching that there are only two kinds of flowering plants which is wrong um and they don't see plants vascular plants the green land plants as having two big groups the those that are reproduced by spores and those that reproduce by seeds so um that's of the vascular types and the other ones that are um, mosses, liverworts, anthocerotes and their relatives we are not covering right now for the purposes of this session and the, these sessions anyway. So tonight, uh, now that we've covered the spore bearing plants briefly, we're going to take a little tour of the seed bearing plants. And we're going to then after that, we're going to get in depth with flowering plants because of their tremendous importance. All right, these are all the seeds bearing plants. These are pines and their relatives. This is a, um, a plant from the Philippines uh, related to Araucaria that um, people make their living by uh, draining the resin from the fruits and they, they, into big blocks and they carry them on their backs um, all around to mountain areas to sell little chips to um, poor people in the mountains because the poor people in the mountains need to have those that will burn even if they're damp because the, the compound is very much like turpentine the compound it has um, and they use that to dry their kindling and with dried kindling they can then make a fire to cook with or keep their little uh, bamboo hut warm with a thatched roof you know the, the whole thing this is a very, this over here is a very primitive plant in um, next to the winter AC family, um, a flowering plant. We'll talk more about that when we cover those. Ginkgos, those are those things that are uh, fan-leaved uh, plants. They have little short shoots. They have things that look like fruits, which are really mega sporangia. And they have uh, some other little small things that uh, deliver the, the sperms. Um, the problem with these is the things that have the structures that look like fruits really smell like feet with a fungal problem. So in Washington, D.C., there's a whole street of these. Someone did some very poor uh, planning. And so they have their stinky week. And um, the locals all know about that. Just so, And they say, well, you know... It, it just happens. You know, we have another street there where all the cherries are, and it's beautiful over there, so don't worry about it. Then we have the cycads, and the cycads are really amazing plants. They have so many cool things about that I'll talk about. And this is a needum, a joint fir. In tropical West Africa, it is so damp and so humid and rains so much all the time. There are not anything that we, that we could say would be decent. Um, greens for people to eat so those leaves are a little on the thick side they draw they 
treat them in different ways. And, and that's what their lettuce is. You know, all their, they'll, they'll wrap different sorts of meats and pieces of fish and things in there. And um, then they take the um, megasporangia and do things with them too. So very important plants for that part of the world. Okay, so seed plants and ferns both have xylem and phloem. They have the alternation of generations. So there's a gametophytic stage which is haploid, and there's a sporophytic stage, which is diploid. So there's, they're, they're going to make the um, gametes to be able to reproduce properly. Um, they're different because they branch laterally. They don't branch dichotomously like m many ferns and especially the lycopods do. There is one exception, and that is the gingerbread palm does branch dichotomously. No one has ever understood why that happens. Barry Tomlinson, Mr. Palm Anatomy, looked at that from top to bottom, made movies, you name it, and he just said, you know, this is what it does. So the entire shoot apex gets divided in two, and two branches result. Very strange kind of thing. Um, they disperse by seeds, which makes sense if we're tall, calling them seed plants. They have pollen and ovules rather than antheridia and archegonia. You remember the antheridia was the little, the little um, pustule that uh, pops open when all the sperm shoot out, and the archegonia is like the little Spanish cup with the ball in the bottom, hoping to get a date. You know, moving around looking for that. Um, here we have pollen. Some pollen's windborne. Some pollen is in the baskets of the bees, there are all kinds of, of ways for pollen to get around. And then the ovules are always inside an ovary. The best way to think about an ovary is an ovary has one or more carpels. And a carpel is sort of like, if this is a leaf, and if we have some ovules along one side, we're going to take that and roll it and then put several of them together here and there'll be a central area. There'll be a, a stigma and a style and then this tube comes down here and then the ovule sitting in the bo bottom or, or the side here and it'll get pollinated if a pollen tube uh, germinates and penetrates it. So that's sort of the story with that. Now this, I wish I could see this better. How can I put this on? Do you remember how I put it on max? So I can make it bigger. How, about, I, how do I make how do I make it big so it takes up my whole screen? Um, on the bottom right is a expanding button. If you hover over it uh, in the view screen itself, if you hover, you'll see a. Oh, got it. Got it. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can see things. It's a lot easier to know what you're talking about when you can see it. <laughs> All right. So as we look at this, this is called a, a phylogenetic tree. The only difference between this and what people used to do is in phylogenetics, you have to have a group that you're comparing everything else to. And you can only group things based on the possession of a some kind of unique, infrequent character. So you're betting that all of everything from needum to flowering plants is related because it has biradial seed symmetry. That's the one characteristic that is always, always, or there's a function of it if it's a two-state kind of a characteristic and then these things all go together because of that you'll notice that there's really no decent way to to segregate cycads from ginkgos but they fall in this group compound female stroboli that's the pine the pines and the cupressus groups the conifers all have that in common so that's how you see these things simple pinnate leaves Ovules, adaxial, on sporophyll. Well, that's I was talking about the origin of the of the pistil, 
And um, that's what all these things have out here. So that's how you read these things. And so what you, the, the principal requirement is by having this characteristic here, you're making a hypothesis that this is what happened based on that. So if it turns out that there's two ways to do that, and, there, and it occurs frequently, then you can no longer group this and you have to do a reclassification. That, that's what it's all about. But it's much better than in the old days, whoever was bigger or yelled the most or worked at the most prestigious institution would have their way. And that, that was really not the way to do science at all. All right. So we're going to talk about gymnosperms. We'll talk about ginkgos, some conifers, Nitaceae, and then angiosperms uh, briefly, flowering plants. Okay. So this is a great big, huge thing that's meant for you folks to study more than to read right now and learn. Just remember that the, that each group has some kind of, I don't know why that turned yellow. That's really weird. Um, each group has, these are the, the characteristics that, that define them. So it's better for me to go on each one of the slides instead of this um, summary because it's kind of too much stuff in one place. The one thing I want you to get a hint of before we get there, though, is there are four kinds of flowering plants. There are the ANA clade, which is or the ANA grade, I should say, which is really the primitive flowering plants. Here it's the um, water lilies, the true water lilies. Um, so it's Nufara and Nymphaea, the Nymphaeaceae. The basal magnolias. This is everything that has flower parts in threes or numerous parts. They have bundles of vessels in very small groups. They have these ethereal oil cells everywhere. So we can all we all know the smells of the Loraceae versus the Ananaceae versus the magnolias versus the winter racy, all those things are magnolia relatives. And they do, their wood is very weird. It's not like the regular dicot wood. So for years, people would say they were dicots, but they were weird. Well, the reason why they were weird dicots is that they belonged to, in, in one group of being weird. And when we looked at the DNA, DNA sequences, it, it was absolutely true. So it, it, that's what alerted us to go back and find this stuff. All of this came into being in a very clear way right around my first year of graduate school, which was 1980. And I had the privilege of being at the New York Botanical Garden when Arthur Cronquist, the great plant evolution person, was there doing battle with Vicki Funk, one of the founding cladists in plant science, and Gareth Nelson and Ro and Rosen, the two, the fish and the bird guys down at the American Museum. So we would go as students and meet with all the other graduate students from all 12 CUNY campuses at the American Museum. And the seminar would start at seven and we would be there till like 2 a.m. Then we'd go to a, some, you know, slouchy bar on the West Side Highway or something and get cheap beer. But we would just debate for hours and you know all the all the people from the new york botanical garden we go in there and we had all our references and photocopies of things and it was it was nice we learned a lot but that's where all this stuff happened so okay the cycads they're they're the ones that were around when the dinosaurs were around they have a unique nerve toxin i had an old roommate that used to get up and go uh, to uh, Columbia University first thing in the morning and remove the brains of 16 rats and disassociate the proteins with the nerve toxins that are in the cycads. And um, his uh, dissertation was to create an artificial nerve, which he ended up doing it lived for 16 nanoseconds or something like that. The idea, well, the eventual idea was to find a way to, to, um, restore some movement if you can get to a patient within a half hour of having a stroke that, that was his goal in life now is it max Planck doing all kinds of things playing god all over the place more importantly for our ecology our 
the cycads fix uh, nitrogen. And they have these coralloid roots, which do all kinds of things like that and support it. Um, the cycads are also very controversial because the people that are collectors of cycads are crazy collectors. Um, during Hur Hurricane Wilma, about a dozen Fairchild volunteers came during the storm with trucks dug up cycads and drove away with them. It turns out that they were people who had, were employed by a guy that lives on Sardinia to come over and steal 28 cycads that were extinct in the wild. And during the, the, the storm is when they did it. And um, all of us were absolutely just dumbfounded. People saw stuff come out of the garden and didn't think anything of it. Thought, geez, they got back to work fast. You know, the it's only three o'clock. The storm started, stopped about midday. Well, these guys had been waiting for three years for their chance and they took it. So um, Interpol found the guy and found the plants, but um, they didn't want to extradite him. So I don't know what ever happened, but it was, it was a shock to us. That's for sure. Psychads are worth a lot of money, for, not only for their value in medicine and working with those uh, really toxic compounds, but um, just for a whole lot of other quasi-religious and cultural kinds of, of reasons. These girdle girdling leaf traces are really strange too because they wrap all the way around the stem, you know, in a, in a helix as opposed to the, the way that um, other ones are like a branched tree. They're sympodia, but these aren't. They're girdling. These are those on the left are the coralloid roots. This uh, nostoc is in the uh, roots here. That's a blue green alga. Okay, which is actually sort of in the bacterial phylum as opposed to being a, an, an alga. All right, so if you imagine a pine cone, which you, you shouldn't for this, but you have a thing that kind of looks like a cone here in Zamia. And this is actually, you could call it a cone too, but it's a very a loosely wound cone. There have been several of us that have been accused of being not too tightly wound, and now I kind of guess we know where they get it. Anyway, so the cycas group, which are in the Cycadaceae, as opposed to the Zamia group in the Zamiaceae, the, these are... Um, the sporophylls are these individual things. This corresponds to this leaf thing I was talking about before. Just imagine that those are rolls of paper that are rolled lengthwise, and you, then you can understand what's going on here. Um, so our Kunti in Florida, the proper name for that at this moment is Zamia integrifolia. The world authority on that group is Dr. Dennis William Stevenson at the New York Botanical Garden. Our local expert is uh, Dr. Javier Francisco Ortega, who's at FIU and has had a huge number of students working on psychedelics and their relatives, especially conservation genetics and what's called phylogeography. And the way they do that is they use all these uh, genetic um, fingerprints to find out which populations were the likely source of the individuals and which populations were the recipients or might be a plant that landed there and selfed. Well, these wouldn't because they're dioecious, but the other ones could, or a couple of them got there. So there's all kinds of things. There may be some of these that change sex. I, I propose that in we haven't found it, but it makes sense for a group like this. Now we get to the maiden hairs, the ginkgophyta. Ginkgos are well known as a gift from China when they were friendly. Um, ginkgos are also the things that all the graduate students take the ginkgo pills to help their memory retention and think better. But all that really does is stimulate circulation in your brain. So the problem with it is People that take a lot of ginkgo and then drink vasoconstrictors can give themselves a stroke a lot easier or 
drinking, uh, uh, having taking ginkgo tablets or capsules and drinking lots of uh, beverages with um, caffeine is a dangerous thing. I ended up with a very scary um, migraine one time uh, cramming for an exam. So I don't recommend it to anyone. So here's our mega sporangiate stroboli. So this is this is like the, the cycad cone that you just looked at. And there's a little hole in it so the sperms can find their way to it. It's just a it's just an inside out, you know, like a um, what's a good way to describe it? When you when you there's some plants, uh, a fig, a fig has all the ovules on the inside. If you take that and fold it out. You get a dorstenia. It's that's the same kind of thing going on here. So if we think of that, we don't have to get um, scared of it. This is what they look like in the fall um, when their fruits are going to come off and when the leaves have turned because there's been a hard frost. That's very pretty. That's reason the reason why they planted them where they did in Washington D.C. And here's a little shot here with the little uh, uh, sperm. You know, get it's kind of like the Woody Allen, everything you want to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask. Get that egg, get that egg, and there it is. Go in the little micro pile there to, to, to do some fertilization. All right, now we get to the pines. This is a Norfolk Island pine. The Australian pines you see are not pines at all. They're really a flowering plant. Um <clears throat> The thing with the pines and their relatives is they all have a lot of different kinds of resins. Most of them are monoecious, which means they have unisexual flowers, but two on the same plant. So you remember that there are these little brown things that people call male cones, which is kind of a misnomer. Um, and then you have the regular pine cones that we know. They're on the same plant, much like the flowers at the top of the corn plant and the corn cob at the bottom with all of that silk. Well, each one of those silks is really um, a style. The tip of it is a stigma. So you're holding the female receptive organ, hoping to catch pollen and bringing it in to fertilize the egg, which will give you the corn kernel. Okay, so it's the same kind of thing going on here. The, the difference, though, here is that the uh, the little, um, let me see if it's on the next, I think it's on the next one. Yeah. Under On the scale, you have two seeds on the bottom side of the scale. So you have one scale and another scale and another scale. They have seeds on the bottom. Okay, so that, that's how that works. Okay. Is anybody lost yet? We good? All right. Here's a a um, this is this is the slash pines here. The let me see if I go back one. Did I skip something? No. Okay. Taxodium bald cypress. We have bald cypress and pond cypress. Here's the story. It's probably one species, but what most um, geneticists are telling us is they actually think it's okay to call them two different things, the pond versus the bulb, because it's what's called an epigenetic response. If the young plant is, is it saturated, sitting in water, it'll behave like a pond cypress. If it's in a drier area, it'll behave like a bald cypress. So the bald cypress have rounded knees and their leaves, when you look at them, are like flat, like this. The, the um, uh, pond cypress have the leaves twisted and they're going up. So it's like touchdown kind of thing. And then their... Um, knees are pointed sort of like a sugar cone so that's how you can remember the difference here's a saguaya dendron a redwood and i just want to tell you a little brief story you know 
the tallest the tallest the tree should be able to grow is 98 meters and that's because gravity accelerates at 9.8 meters per second squared but then why are the redwoods taller than 98 meters nobody knew for years they made up all kinds of stories well in the forestry school the big the biggest japanese forestry school outside of tokyo decided they would send some of their students to California and work with the California parks. And um, they have these new um, things that go on cranes and just go, you know, forever high. And they put a student on it, you know, leave it to a graduate student. If you drop something, they're not too worried about it, which is really not very nice. But so they sent him to the top of the tree. And what they found out is all the upper branches have on the leaves there are these things that are called hydropotes h-y-d-r-o-p-o-t-e-s kind of like you have on bromeliads they're these little scale like looking things so what they do is they bring in all kinds of nutrients they have little proteinaceous mucilage about the color of the mucilage glue you used to use on paper when you were in kindergarten and when the it goes to a certain extent, and when a certain number of minerals have gone through, the, the cap breaks off, and then it functions like a hydrothode, and it controls water in and out. So you have these things absorbing nutrients and controlling water, which they get from the clouds because they're so tall. So that's how they're able to do it. So from, a, from 98 meters up, they feed themselves completely with these mechanisms because of these specialized features that no one has known about for 500 years until some four foot 11 graduate student in forestry from Japan said, why are there trees taller than can theoretically be possible? Doesn't it bother anybody that no one knows why? <laughs> so he found out, smart guy. So there is always something new to learn. Keep your eyes open. And I'm sure you'll see something somebody else hasn't seen. So here's the uh, pond cypress branch. And you'll see that all these things are twisted. And here's the um, uh, bald cypress branch. And you'll see that they're flat. Okay. Now, the joint first. What a bunch of weird things these uh ovules are sterile but they function as nectaries and here's the anthers that are fertile that have the pollen and this is the opposite all these things on the outside that look like stamens are like staminoids they they don't have any pollen they have nectar though and then the ovules are in, inside okay so that's how these things get visited it's very cool so, joint furs are dioecious. So that this means that those stroboli are in separate individuals. So that's even more a problem. Um, they have structures that look like vessels, but they're not really. They are closed on either end, and they have like a little sewer cap on them. The leaves are the only greens in the Cameroon's Gabon, Ivory Coast, which is Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. Those are the, um, there is a British and a French Cameroon. There's a fantastic botanical garden over there, by the way. And see, so you have Needham chips. They grind them up and put them with other um, vegetable protein to make a dish that looks like this. All the vegans would love this thing. And then they have your Emping Meligno, which is the um, um, Needham chip uh, powder for you to have those uh, fried uh, fish that are uh, uh, dipped in a batter made of um, something very similar to beer with the uh, Emping Malinjo. All right, well, uh, since since this the leaf of this plant is the lettuce in tropical Africa, you, know, you have your eggs and your shredded coconut and now you have your lettuce, you can make yourself a little salad, you know? It's kind of a big deal. 
because they're desperately, uh, they're really desperate for uh, things that are green. They need that uh, magnesium to, to get away from uh, um, some of the things that uh, are associated with anemia. Now we get to the magnolia fitta, which are the flowering plants. We used to call them angiosperms all the time. We still can do that. Um, but uh, the formal name is magnolia fitta. Um, that's conversation of another day. I can do nomenclature if you're really interested. <laughs> okay. Uh, flowering plants have flowers. Boy, that was a uh, novelty, eh? Leaves, stems, and roots. There is one family without a root, and that is the Raphlesiaceae. They have flowers that are only five meters wide, and they are the color of something like a skunk cabbage. Oh, and some of the colors of the Corallariza orchid and some things like that. And they really smell bad, extremely bad. So uh, not only does Indonesia have the um, Mr. Stinky plant, um, which is an aeroid that has a huge space that's beige on the outside, purple on the inside, and then this spadix coming up with, with flowers on it that smell like um, rotting corpses. But then you have these five meter wide flowers on the ground that look like little pools that are full of something that very much looks like the goop from um, Ghostbusters that if you get it on you, it's much worse than any skunk liquid that you can imagine. I mean, when you first go to the forest in, in uh, Indonesia, just keeping your food down is a major job because this stuff is stinky, man. I mean, it's just, wow. So, um, the flowers get the double fertilization, okay? So there's um, two different um, nuclei that are involved from the, uh, the the pollen that sends the pollen tube down through the the style and the stigma. There's stigma and the style into the ovary. Now, this is our little cladogram of all the flowering plants. You'll see the dicots, the monocots, the magnolia family, and the primitive guys. So that's kind of in a nutshell what that's all about. This is just another more modern um, cladogram of the same thing. And for I don't know why it doesn't it doesn't come out here very well, very clearly, but that's, that may be just a function of it being seen here. God, I'm sorry about this yellow. I don't know why it's doing that. Could be something I did by accident. Anyway, this first group, the ANA grade, they really don't, they either have no perianth or they have things that integrate between stamens and and um, petals and sepals. They have um, air canals in their stems. There's no vascular cambium, and they have these little vessels throughout the stem. What, what you have to understand with these upper vascular plants is you can either have a vessel, which is exactly like a straw, a plastic straw. They're open on both ends, and they're one after another, and they just... The water just flies up there in this island. Plants that are more primitive than that, or that are in the magnolia group, for example, they have some of vessels that are in small groups, but they also have these things that are like tracheids. And so a tracheid is a thing that looks like a vessel, but it's closed at each end. Some of them have a thing that looks like a sewer top. Some of them have holes but they have many holes on the sides. So the water kind of goes, have to go from the chamber into it up and back out and then back in and up and back out. That's why they don't really get very big. When you think about magnolias and their relatives, the tallest ones are like a hundred feet tall. That's nothing. When you think about it, the, uh, the things that our furniture is now made of that's coming from 
Southeast Asia are dipterocarps, and they're a really weird family. They have a fantastic wood, but they have a, a long fruits with wings. And, um, you know, there's the smallest one is 75 meters tall. That's 248 some odd feet tall. So this uh, group of magnolia relatives, the, the wood is very weak. It, they really can't get that big. Then you have the monocots and their perianthus in threes, just like the magnolia groups. But a lot of them are modified, you know, like lips on an orchid and things. The vascular bundles are spread throughout the stem. That's the big difference. So if you have a palm in your backyard and you think you're going to go out and chop it down, good luck. All those vascular systems in there, one after another, they're mostly phloem fibers, right? That's what remains. The other stuff goes. So what do you have? These stone cells, they're like a rock, man. I have a palm in my backyard. And the people that owned the house before us tried to get rid of it. So they took out half of the stem. And they couldn't finish it. It destroyed their chainsaw. So I have a palm that's withstood all the hurricanes and everything with half a stem. Doesn't scare me. It'll be a long time before that falls down. So it's been, what, 15 years so far anyway. So, you know, they're tough. They're tough. The big thing with the monocots also is that their pollen looks like a little canoe. Um, they, they have very unusual pollen with the magnolia relatives. They, they're usually, they're not three furrows or pores. They're four or five or they look like a flying saucer or some other kind of weird thing. The dicots, the one characteristic that every dicot has that can never be denied or vary is that the pollen has three furrows, three pores, or three furrows with pores. That's all it can have. Can't have anything else. So how do they figure this out? Well, after the, all the sequencing was done and they looked at the DNA, not only the sequences, but what's important is DNA has this thing called the molecular clock. And you can figure out when groups of traits separated from other groups. It's, it's I mean, in geological time, it's very cool. But, you know, the, the resolution on that is pretty... Uh, thick you know it's not something you can tell from two days ago um so the basal magnolia it's going to have two three or four cotyledons monocots have just one cotyledon dicots have just two cotyledons so with that and this thing about the um, the pollen then the other thing you need to know about is the vascular bundles form a definite cambium with the xylem on the inside and the phloem on the outside. That's why for a real dicot, you can go out there and ring the stem, excuse me, ring the stem, and you'll kill the tree, which people do when they want to get rid of um, invasives. So, now that we're done with that brief introduction, I know you guys are all falling out of your chairs by now. This is a simple diagram about the life cycle. All right. It varied from the anther to the pollen, the megaspore to the megagametophyte, blah, 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 to the embryo. Okay. And then the seed, it germinates, and you got a new plant. Okay. Typical flowers, you know, the, the petals, when spoken about collectively are corolla the sepals when spoken about collectively are calyx the calyx and the corolla one spoken of collectively is the perianth okay why peri anth around the stamens they're anth right except the lacedoniaceae which has the stamens in the middle and the pistils on the outside so um Here's the stamens composed of the anther and the filament. The pistil is composed of the stigma, style, and ovary. There's a receptacle at the top here, and there's a pedicel. Pedicel is just a flower stalk, that's all. 
if it's a stalk of a single flower or if it's a stalk of a group of flowers in inflorescence, then the stalk is a peduncle. The pedicel is the last little stalk connected to the receptacle in the calyx. Okay. If it's an inferior ovary, this thing will be down here. But that's a whole other deal. And this is just another picture of the same along with your little floral diagram for those people that like to see that. Okay, then we have floral structural types. Perfect flowers have stamens and pistils, and they all function. Imperfect flowers have either stamens or pistils. Okay. And they function. So you get a cucurbit, but you have a staminate flower and a pistil flower. People call them male flowers and female flowers. It's technically incorrect, but as long as they understand the basis, it's okay. Now, hypogenous flower is when the calyx is below the ovary. Ta-da! The calyx is below the ovary. So this is a hypogenous flower. Because you're talking about the position of the, the gynus. The sepals are hypo to the gynus, so it's a hypogenous flower. That's all. Easy way of thinking about it. Epigenous flower is the calyx is above the ovary. So put this in your memory. Look into my eyes. A hypogenous flower. Is a, is a tomato flower that will turn into a tomato. Sepals on the bottom. But, uh, fruit. Okay? A pigeon is flower. Sepals on the top. We all know guavas. They're super easy to see. We all know... Um, The squash, the Italian squash. Can't think of it. Anyway, the Italian squash is an inferior ovary as well. We also know bananas. Those are inferior ovaries too. Inferior ovaries always comes from an epigenous flower. Okay. And a perigenous flower, there is only, there are only, there are, for us, let's just say, it's a rose hip. Leave it at that. You'll always remember what a rose hip looks like. So if you remember rose hips versus bananas and guavas versus a tomato, you'll never lose. So you can take these very esoteric, complicated words and put them into something that makes sense. Okay. I teach. I used to teach a course called the Botany of the Grocery Store. We had so much fun; it was great. I'm going to ask a question right now to see if people are paying attention. And at the end of our session, I'd like someone who thinks they know the answer to put it in the chat. All of us that are good folks, we eat our celery and our salad. What is a celery? Is it a stem? Is it a flower? Is it a petiole? Is it a fruit? What is it? So, botanically speaking, we'll want to see that at the end. All right. So, perfect flowers have both stamen and pistils in the same flower. They can be bisexually or functionally unisexual. The functional unisexual part, that comes in a lot with the hollies. The hollies are a whatever. There's staminate flowers with pistils that are empty. There's pistolate flowers with stamens that are all shriveled. All right, ladies, you can stop laughing. And they have bisexual flowers. And not only they are not only regular bisexual flowers, they are self-compatible. So if you say screw you to them, they will. No problem. Okay. Here's a pistolet flower. You see the inferior over here? It's beautiful. 
And this, now this is a staminate flower. The stamens are in here. There's nothing here. And this is a, I think this is some kind of louvre or something like that. Okay. Hypogenous flowers. They have a superior ovary. The calyx and the corolla are below the ovary. Here's a lovely dissection of that. Okay. And this is a drawing of it. This is where I put the two groups of words together so you can learn them. Here's an epigenous flower. Okay, so that's the calyx is on top of the ovary. Okay, same over here. The vast majority of the ericaceae are that way. Not all of them, but some of them, the vast majority are. Here's a perigenous flower. Look at this. Look at this. And see, here's your rose hip. There it is. So if you have a rose hip, the ovary is actually superior because this is a calyx and it sits on top of it. But because the calyx and corolla surround it, it's on the periphery. It's periginous. All right. There you go. Pretty cool stuff. And this is just a nice little drawing to remind you. Something to put under your pillow so that it absorbs during the night. It gets into your head. Then you have actinomorphic, which means radial in all directions. And zygomorphic, which they usually have bilateral too. Bilateral means there's only one plane of symmetry. And zygomorphic, zygomorphic can also mean there isn't really one plane of symmetry anywhere to have two equal parts. Now, there is a book written by Radford and a whole bunch of other people from the University of North Carolina in the early 70s called The Vascular Plant Systematics. And in that book, it was this gigantic paper book. They had every single possible drawing about everything and lists and lists of pages of things. And from that, by the way, you can, you can find it online. And if I were you, I'd go find it and download it before somebody decides that it shouldn't be given away for free. Um, Radford, Dickinson, Massey, and Bell. Radford, Massey, and Bell were plant systematists like me. And Dickinson was a plant anatomist. So, you know, that was really a kick-butt uh, biology department. So these are all the actinomorphic flowers. Then we get to estivation. So there's two things about plant parts in bud. If the plant parts are in floral bud, it's called estivation. All that means is how the different margins overlap. Why is that important? Well, sometimes you want to just get a quick notion about a plant without necessarily knowing too much about it. So if we cut a flower in half and we see that all the parts, one overlaps the other one going to the left, we know that it's from the neotropics, the new world. If it goes to the right, we know it's from the Eastern hemisphere. No doubt about it. If it's a native, if you look at a, uh, flower of a uh, a yam, you'll see they go to the right. Well, of course they do. They're from Africa. So those are just little things. I swear to God, it's like they invented in Europe since they have very few species. They kind of ran out of botany to do, you know. We're still not done with flora North America yet, but there, there's a lot. And then here are a whole lot of things about Sex expression, bisexual plants, unisexual, monoecious, dioecious, polygamous, which is a whatever. I, I, we could probably call those like pansexuals almost. Um, floral sex expression is analogous and not homologous for those of animals. It's just we kind of tolerate it. Uh, 20 years ago we didn't, but now we do. So an inflorescence is a group of flowers. An infructescence is a group of fruits.
A synfluorescence is a group of inflorescences. So if you have a bunch of little daisies, and if the daisies are in a form like this, since each daisy is an, actually an inflorescence of little florets, then it would be a synfluorescence, a simple one or a compound or, you know, whatever it was. So that's how those things come into being. So here's a spike, and that basically means that the oldest flowers are the ones on the bottom, and it they um, keep the tip keeps growing until the plant runs out of energy, basically. But they're all sessile all on the stalk. The raceme, each one has a little flowering stalk separately, subtended by one bract, which is really just a leaf-like thing. Then you have a thing that this is a a also with a raceme, but these are actually corymbs that are at the end because they're in a half circle to the outside. Then you have an umbel, and there's several different kinds of umbels, but the basic one is all of the flower little pedestals are varying lengths, but they all came from the same place. A thirst, this is like a double, um, where was that chart? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I gotta go. Okay. Okay. A thirst is a, a double dicasium. So this is actually a thirst here too. So, you know, it's very opposite, very, um, very few plants. You can't get a thirst on a plant that doesn't have opposite leaves. If it has opposite leaves, it's going to have opposite branches. And everything it does is opposite. So as each sepal forms, there's another one forming the other side. Okay. This is a species I collected on the summit of Mount Ayangana in Guyana when I was a postdoc. Cyathium, here's a really weird kind of a, uh, inflorescence. Uh, let's see if we get closer. No, we know this one isn't close because we're just talking about it. There's a pistolate flower in the center and it's surrounded by little male flowers that are just one stamen apiece. And then there's a little nectary that in, that gets the insects to go there. So they walk all over all the flowers and pollinate them. The grass spikelet is another really specialized kind of flower. But we'll save that for the grass, you know, the monokine thing. Here are dorsal sepal and lateral petals, and then there's a column, and these are the, the uh, lip for the orchids. Here's a head, sunflower. Now here's a spathe, which is this white thing here, and then a spadix is here. And in the different genera of Aeraceae, the genera are distinguished by whether all of these are bisexual or whether the pistolet are down here and the stamina are up here or what the story is. That's how you find out what genus it is. And then since this is, um, oh, since these are staminid and pistolate on the same plant, it's going to be a monoecious plant, right? Same with the story with the begonias. And you have the staminid flower and you have the pistolate flower and there's your little wings underneath. Okay. Now, papayas are the weirdest case in history because there used to be a staminid plant and a pistolate plant for years and years. But now there are all these ones that are called Hawaiians, which are little smaller ones, not like the big Mexican ones. And they're bisexual. And not only are they bisexual, but they self. And when you grow them in South Florida, you have to spray them with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, or you get this little weird um, fly that lays its eggs on them. And then you open it up and it's full of all these little maggots, which is very unpleasant. So then you have all the different kinds of fruits and their definitions. And, and I'll just leave you to your own devices about that. 
I hope you folks will have, you know, long-term access to this. And then you'll be able to see what's what. Now, you see, this is an Ananasi. And its parts are in threes. And it has individual monocarps. Those are individual pistils from its flower. The flower, they were together, but then they grew apart. Okay? And each one of these is a separate pistillate flower from the pineapple fruit. Okay? And then here's a here's a poem. They get pomologists in horticulture. And all it means is this is from a perigenous flower. Remember, the apple has a perigenous flower. And then you have this little hole here that where the where the um, pollination took place. All right, then you have all these different types. This is just basically reference for you to be able to look up rather than you to learn this stuff. Uh, I'm in the the graduate and undergraduate course that I teach, all my my tests are um, open book. Because there's no way that uh, people are going to learn all this stuff the first time around, that's for sure. You have to work with it for a long time. Now, here's this uh, uh, spatter doc, new far, and you'll see that um, these things are transitional from the, the sepals in. Um, this is another really mm, close magnolia relative, and you'll see all those parts are numerous in a spiral. And this, I believe, is another, is this might be the, um, that uh, primitive plant family. It's the most primitive in the world from New Caledonia. So, okay, this is, this is that. There's my little thanks to the Broward County Board of County Commissioners. And that's about it from that. Um, I hope everybody has gotten like a general feel for seed plants. Now we've seen vascular plants that reproduce by spores. And now we've seen ones that produce by seed. And then our next two lectures will be our journey through the flowering plants. Mm -hmm. so you'll actually be able to learn the four kinds of flowering plants. And you will never be a heretic again saying <laughs> that there are only dicots and monocots. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Bipoli, I've, I've been diligently searching the web for some talking points. And uh, Gia has taken up your challenge Who? on Gia Lee. I'm going to okay. Post question it was what do you think celery that we eat is petiole stems what are they so gia writes she's guessing that it is petiole yes yes they are all petioles it's the only vegetable that is made up 100 percent of petioles just and here's another lesson is everybody ready for something that is so practical it's disgusting <laughs> <laughs> if you look at something that pricks your finger on a plant, if you cut it in half with a razor blade, and there's absolutely nothing inside, mm -hmm. you have a prickle. Okay? If you cut it in half and it is smiling at you, kind of like the shape of the of the celery, see how it smiles at you? Mm -hmm. It is its origin is from a leaf. And if its origin is from a leaf and it harms you, it is a spine. If, on the other hand, it pokes you, you cut it in half, it has that round steel with a pith surrounded by a bunch of little fibers. It is a thorn and its origin is from a stem so we have thorns are stems spines are leaves and prickles are epidermal defense mechanisms that have no veins in them whatsoever is that cool or what that is very very fascinating very fascinating 
Right. It's so good to see Dr. Pipoli again. Oh, yeah, PJ, you're great, man. She's a master gardener par excellence. Yeah. She's been watching many of our live streams. So oh, that's very, fantastic. It's a happy coincidence. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, yes. He's, he's a native plant veteran. Absolutely. That's One of wonderful. the elite. Oh, that's wonderful. The, I she's compliment actually, you. As a gardener, she's an eminence, I could say. Well, uh, Dr. Pipoli, I've pulled up our gingerbread palm. Oh, the yeah. They are so cool. Mm -hmm. They are just, look at that dichotomous branching. Oh, my God. See, that is so weird. Right here, too. If anybody takes a tour, and that's something you guys could do, even though you're a native plant group, mm -hmm. take a day and go down and get an appointment to go tour the Montgomery Botanical Center. Mm -hmm. It's different from any other garden because it's, it's endowments, which are significant are for the strict purpose of keeping collections of endangered palms and cycads in a place where people from the country of origin can get to them and everyone in the world can study them. Hmm. So their purpose is to provide material for researchers all over the world. Hmm. They are the nicest people. And, you know, their whole, their whole um, mission is, is to share. So when you go to an institution whose mission is to share, there's no greed or weirdness. Everybody's happier there. They're complimented that you take the time and have the interest. And they'll right. give one hell of a tour. And well, since Coral, Coral Gables, here we come sometime in right. the future. And then when you come out of there, you make a right turn on US1 and you'll be a captain's tavern that has the best fish in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> oh, With here we go, Doctor Pipoli. Arnon, tour, tour, and and a rest stop. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> how do you think I got so chubby, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not far behind you. I wanted to share also the um, ginkgo. So we found some images on microsporangia, but not any on the megasporangia. You want to touch on that at all? Uh, I think. Well, here's a megasporangium, see, and it mm -hmm. has a little micro pile, and that mm -hmm. picture of that is where the sperm was swimming up in there. Yes, yes. It, it looks like know, a little half. It happens swimmer. up on the tree, and uh -huh. there has to be a hell of a lot of rain coming down for it to splash from from one to the other. Mm -hmm. That's that's why they're not really efficient. I think what happens a lot is. There are things like flies and and maybe even a, some facultated bees that just happen to go and happen walk down. around on it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not the wind itself. I mean, it's it, it's just not going to happen. That, that yeah, project. much it's, like our magnolias that are pollinated by beetles, of all things. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, the large the large flowers are there for the beetles to land on. So they're they're mostly like landing pads for them. Right. Well, the 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 uh, water lilies are pollinated by beetles as well. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You remember, there's a there's another lecture about pollination syndromes. So if it's white, if they're white flowers, they're going to have a smell in the evening. If they're red flowers, they're attracting hummingbirds. If they're blue flowers, they'll always have some bees. And yellow flowers as well. So all of those kinds of things have different, um, even even uh, tropical sage. There, I have seen some little weird looking um, ruby throated hummingbirds flying down, wanting to know what this tropical sage was because it was red. They just yeah. they can't help themselves. Yeah. It's like you know what the color is that does that to us humans on a global scale. Red. No. No. Yellow. yellow. Any fruit that's yellow, humans will eat right away. You don't they don't have to know what it is. A baby will eat it. We are drawn to that. Interesting. Yeah. And all the great apes have the same characteristic. And uh, you know, our 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 first cousins, the uh, chimps, 
my wife says you shouldn't say that so much but i guess once they know you they'll understand oh, oh. <laughs> when, when you come from a biologist it takes a different tone altogether. yeah yeah look at that yeah isn't that weird isn't it isn't it so t uh folks the people that are tuning in i mean i've seen this in uh it looks like this is in Spanish, but yeah, it's from Mexico. Estambre yeah. is the anthers, and the carpels are around it, right, Doctor? Yeah, yeah. The stamens are in the middle, and they're surrounded by the ovaries, which is just completely inside out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so the ST right here, folks. That's the stamens. These are in the stamens. middle. Yeah. And that's the from the article where it was described. Beautiful, very interesting and uh, unusual plant. Oh, and if there's one in Brazil now, oh my God, that is something else. <laughs> before there was only one in Mexico, and it was at the weirdest mountain. It, it was at actually it was at the mount, the same mountain that um, um, perennial corn comes from. Oh wow! Yeah, fascinating. And this is uh, this is the answer to uh, your question that you posed to the audience. So Absolutely. the leaves are up here, and the petioles are the very ones cool. that are surrounding a very very small stem, uh, reduced due to yeah. uh, preferred selection, artificial selection. Well, um, a lot of them they trim it off too because they don't want all that leaves. And the the thing is, if if people have, although I, I'm not supposed to recommend different treatments for people what my what my wife does when she has a slightly upset stomach is she clips the leaves off of the um celery and makes a soup mm -hmm. and drinks it that's because mm -hmm. her mother and her grandmother and her great grandmother and everybody in colombia did that so well, you've yeah. got a lot of fan mail. Um, I wanted to put this also into the chat box. This is the esteemed um, 1973 Best. book uh, on yeah. ecosystematics by Radford. And uh, it is available online for you guys to uh, read. 916 pages long, uh, probably well worth every single uh page that you do yes if you ever online. lack a um a cocktail word you can get lots of them there i see yes you can talk about your nasty neighbor who has epitropous ovules uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy so i will um take some fan mail at this point uh Got, uh, PJ writes, "You are my teacher. If I'm great at, uh, if I'm great, this is greater for sure." Um, and she has definitely saved this video to rewatch. Thank share. you very much, PJ. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's coming from somebody who hasn't talked about it. They've done it. Ellie, that taught everyone in her community. She led her whole community for more than twenty years. She was, she was the lady man, the number one. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so, folks, if there's any questions, uh, now is a good time to take uh, take them before we conclude. Uh, doctor, would you like us to surf the web and uh, touch on any single points within your? I, I let me see what our time looks like. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. I didn't need it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me think. Um. Oh, I know. Why don't we, you uh, type in um, Kunti? Because it'll have the picture of the um, the butterfly, mm -hmm. the and all the other the Atala butterfly and the whole mm -hmm. deal. Yeah, there they are on the right hand side. You see. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is that this butterfly is so hooked on those nerve agents that mm -hmm. they'll also go to sago palms. They'll mm -hmm. go to the, the stupid cardboard palms that are from South Africa. I mean, who in their right mind would want to go eat that? Um, 
and it, it's they all have the same toxins in them you know mm -hmm. there is no bird that will make the mistake of eating one of those twice because it may kill them the first time they eat it because the nerve toxins are really bad i mean think about it if an extract of the roots of a cycad disassociate proteins in your brain i mean you know this is really bad stuff Mm -hmm. And it, that's why I've never figured out why in God's name would the Seminoles make this <laughs> power. I mean, you got to be nuts. Talk about Russian roulette. <laughs> you know, it's, worse than, it's worse than the Yucca Brava in Brazil that has so much of the milky euphorbiaceae sap in it that it has to be boiled and squished and boiled and squished. I think they have to do it like nine times. Oh, wow. You must have to do it like a hundred times with this. Because if you get one ounce of that nerve poison, I mean, your eyes are going to go, and it'll be the end of it, you know? I mean, this stuff is, is, this is, this is worse than ricin. Because it breaks, the ricin incapacitates your the nerves in your brain and kills mm -hmm. you. But this stuff has them disassociate the proteins. I mean, this is just really... Mm -hmm. So just remember, everybody, it's Zamia integrifolia. It turns out that Zamia pumila is on one small island of the Bahamas, mm -hmm. off the main island. Uh, Zamia floridana was a name that Dan... Um, Dan, what the hell is the guy's last name? Dan, Dan, Dan. He was a professor at the University of Florida that was supposed to write the the floor of Florida, Florida. And after having the specimens sequestered for 40 years, he decided he really didn't have the energy to do it. So um, that's when Wonderland took over. There was a lot mm -hmm. of ill feeling across the state for about six years. Because the guy at Florida State was a really national, nationally known guy as well. Dan Austin at FAU. Yeah, they all yeah. got, oh, Dan Ward was the guy's name. So they all got, they all made a trip and took visited the guy at once and kind of surrounded him and said, look, guy, you you know, you won't let anybody see this stuff and you're not publishing it. And I'm telling you, we have no credibility as a discipline in the state. We, we got to get, you know, poop or get off the pot. So mm -hmm. that's what did that. So Zami Integrifoli is right, the right name. I don't know if he's retired yet, but there was a guy at the USDA that did some stuff with psychads too, even though his job was um, classification of monocots. Hmm. Um, USDA uh, uh, Chapman, the Chapman Station thing. So you could do, you, on your field trip, you could do Chapman Field and... Um, boop, Botanical Center Montgomery in the same day. You just have to call them and make appointments. And those are two institutions that I'm predicting are not going to be there in uh, well they won't be in their same form in 50 years. Mm. There's a lot of pressure to make them change. Mm. The Chap yeah. Chapman Field was the USDA plant introduction station. And its purpose was to find new plants from around the world that would benefit horticulture and agriculture in the United States. So that's where a lot of the Fairchild plants were, were, were tested for years. Mm. And it was uh, it was always, a, yeah, Chapman, Chapman Field. Yeah, the Army Aerodrome was there too. But the other big aerodrome was, of course, well, that's where you could go to for lunch. You could go to the uh, 94th Aero Squadron, which is at the end of uh, uh, Red Road. It, Red Road dead ends into the airport, indeed, on the, from the south side going north. And on the right-hand side is the 94th Aero Squadron. And it's the original building with a lovely restaurant in it. <laughs> Dance. Uh -oh. Sing Friday and Saturday night, salsa merengue. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, salsa merengue, bayonato, and <laughs> danzón from Cuba. Uh, reggaeton, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I had fun in Miami, man. I didn't sit around. <laughs> I worked. I was at work at six a.m. and at and at ten p.m. it was party time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, well, thank you so much for joining us. We had a wonderful uh, seed bearing discussion today. Lots of slides. Please go ahead and save this. Um, as you know, it's you, you need to go through it a couple times. Quite a bit, quite a bit. Sixty slides, guys. That was quite a quite a whirlwind. I did it on before. time, right? I did it on time. It is wonderful. I see. I, I didn't want to. My job is not to beat you over the head. My job is to empower you to be looking things up. That's mm -hmm. the my professorial philosophy. It's always been. And at Fairchild, when I taught nomenclature, I didn't have anybody fall out of the chair. No one was asleep. Even though people would come in at 8 o'clock and they were sort of a motley crew, the, the three different courses, everybody learned what they were supposed to learn. Why? Because I the tests were for them to look it up. Because yeah. they're not nomenclature freaks like me. And they don't do this for a living. But they're going to be practicing botanists that need to find information out about plants. So they need to know what name, how do they find out the correct name for this plant? Where do they go? How do they deal with it? So that kind of stuff. Oh, well, thank, thank you very you, much, Ms. Sundar. I really appreciate your compliment. Yes. And please like this video. If you oh, do yeah. like it, uh, please go ahead and like, uh, subscribe. But parting words is like this video. Uh, yes. That way it, uh, it can actually improve our algorithms on YouTube as well. And now that you've, uh, what is it? You've all made the grade because you've learned the clay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's our modus operandi for the next show. Well, guys, thanks so much. Oh, and we will you see you. On the best advertisement. Yeah. Um, coming up in July here on the 26th. Mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, no, I guess the 26th is for the medical school. Um, on the 29th at 2 p.m., it's 29th mm -hmm. July, 2 p.m., the Alvin, Sh Alvin Sherman Library, I'll be giving a talk on the effect of climate change on public health. And I'll talk about how parks mit partially mitigate those things. It's really important. Most people have no idea that we're the only portion, um, Collier, um, Lee, Monroe, Dade, and Broward. We are the only counties in the country that spend from the 1st of April to the 1st of September at UV index 12, which is the cancer producing level, okay? I'm really trying to get the schools to consider changing rec to 1030 in the morning because no one in their right mind should be in the full sun from 12 to 3. You're just you're setting yourself up for um, having skin cancer when you're an old fart like me. That's what's going to happen. I coincidentally, I, I was reading something uh, online about that as well. And with climate change, uh, even more and more counties, not just in Florida, but all the way up through the Midwest, are at risk of very harmful UV exposure, especially during the summer months. Yeah, they but they just don't have it for as many months as we have it. It's just this is a, a, a way of life here, and I don't know why they took it off the weather report because they used to say that right away. Yes. yes. So that, by saying that right away, you know, the way you make things popular, and is like if you have to take a pill, put it in marmalade. If if you have to protect the kids, have competitions for who has the coolest jungle hat. You know that kind of stuff. And then everybody's covered. It doesn't matter what it looks like, but it protects you. And that's what you need. Because what my friends at CDC that were, you know, I've had as roommates going through different colleges and things, they're telling me that kids under 12 get predisposed to skin cancer later on by overexposure at level 12 right now. And there's no doubt about it. So we have to wake up and learn how to live in the tropics because the tropics has arrived. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our third webinar is on August 15th. We'll see you then. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody.